What's up people, hope you're having an awesome day. I'm your host Eamon Hassan and welcome back to another video here at Most Amazing Top 10. This video legit makes me so happy. I can't wait to go on like a 10 minute ride of nostalgia right now, except it's not gonna be nostalgia. It's just gonna be, you know, all my kid dreams and hopes just getting crushed by the theories I'm about to throw out into this video, but it's okay. <laughs> Before I start, can I just preface this with the fact I love Cartoon Network and no one can ever convince me otherwise? Thank you and good night. So this is the Top 10 Scary Cartoon Network. Theories. Uh, starting us off at number 10 is the afterlife cul-de-sac. So what is the only show on Cartoon Network set in a cul-de-sac? Ed, Ed and Eddie. Double D was my favourite, let me just put it out there. He deserved more lines and appreciation, I'm just saying. Anyway, this theory is actually wild. It claims the kids who lived in the cul-de-sac are actually all dead and the neighbourhood is some kind of afterlife slash purgatory. Since all the kids are different ages, they all died between 1900 and 2000 but because they all died died in the cul-de-sac, they all stayed there. Think about it, the show has no other kids, no parents, just the kids we see and even they are a bit weird. I mean they all look a bit sickly, they all have blue tongues which like hello corpse tongues. Okay say if we had to analyze the kids, Rolf is farm obsessed and tends to his animals so he probably died in the early 1900s, Ed and Sarah from the 50s because Sarah is controlling as hell and Ed is a dumbass who simply thrives on comics which were very popular at the time. Naz is a 60s or 70s child, obviously she's carefree, a bit of a flirt, you get the gist. And Kevin was a 90s kid because he's a bully, he rides his bike as an escape and his dad was most likely controlling and abusive which is why in the afterlife he imagines his dad showering him with a lot of gifts. Now I'm not saying this is a foolproof theory but I'm also not not saying that. Coming in at number 9 are the post apocalyptic Flintstones part 1. Again one of my favourite shows, I even saw the old live action remake and loved it. Have yet to go as Betty for Halloween, but soon come, soon come, I promise. Anyway, based off the show, you'd assume Bedrock was situated in the Stone Age. I mean, why wouldn't you? They're called the Flint Stones, they live in Bedrock, this is basically Stone Age propaganda. Either way, this theory claims they actually live in a post-apocalyptic society. Now think about it, the show is basically based on the modern West. They reference technology, religion, culture all the time. Stone Age people didn't have any of that. The theory goes on to say after many many nuclear disasters, the entirety of western civilization collapsed and so the generations after them recovered just enough to create a society based on what they remembered. At number 8 we have the post apocalyptic Flintstones part 2. I love when the theories are so juicy they need a part 2, I'm just sat there like yes girl yes. Anyways the sub theory features the crossover we all died for, the Jetsons meet the Flintstones. I wanted to be in the Jetsons so bad when I watched it when I was young, I literally thought by now, like by 2019 we'd be living in a world like that yet we still even have like flying cars or houses this is shocking well, I've been fed lies this is a betrayal either way moving swiftly on before I get further triggered the theory goes on to say the Flintstones and the Jetsons actually lived in the same world at the same time in this post apocalyptic society they live in we became so divided that one group live in a super advanced society whereas another group is barely hanging on the edges of technology all the talking animals living with the Flintstones Flintstones are synthetic creations. I mean, all the real animals have been extinct for five ever, and no one acknowledges how stupid it is for them to talk to things that didn't even exist with early humans. But, you know, that's none of my business. Filling our number seven slot is Scooby Dooby Depression. I literally bought all the extra Scooby Doo long episode movie things as a kid, and I can't tell you how many times I've watched both live action movies. That is my shit. But either way, from their slang, all the flowers on the mystery machine, even the gang's clothing, you can tell the show was set in the 60s and the theory claims that it was set during one of the worst economic depressions ever. And if you think about it long enough it actually makes a lot of sense. I mean in the show everything is either falling apart or abandoned, hotels are empty, theme parks are ruined, every villain they catch is actually someone who would normally be respected you know like a teacher or a scientist or a historian but they've just fallen on hard times and have just turned to petty crime in this dark period of life. And no, no, I definitely didn't forget about the gang. You'd think they were just hippies out looking for adventure, but really they're like in their late teens, early 20s, not interested in getting proper jobs. They move around all the time because there are no jobs available no matter where they go. They wear the same clothes every day. Do they shower? No one really knows for sure. Do they pay for petrol? I don't know. In conclusion, they're unemployed hobos that accept petrol and food for helping those around them. Knife in my heart. 
dagger in my chest. Now at number six is the Rugrats Affair. Now this was a cute show, I'm not gonna lie. It wasn't my favorite because I thought I was just too grown up for that baby stuff, but it did the job. According to this theory, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, most of the babies on the show aren't real apparently. They're all figments of Angelica's imagination since she actually has no friends. That sounded really savage, I didn't mean it like that. Angelica, you're a lovely girl. She makes up these friends to make up for the fact her parents are too busy working to make time for her. Angelica bases all her friends on the dead children of her parents' his friends. I don't know how believable that bit was, but we carry on anyway. Tommy was stillborn, which explains why Stu is always in the basement making toys. Chucky died with his mum, which explains why Chaz is a nervous wreck 24 7. And Phil and Lil were actually aborted, or their parents suffered a miscarriage. So, because Angelica didn't know the baby's gender, she just created twins. What do you guys think? Viable or Coming in at number 5 is Courage the Cowardly Delusion. Now this was my least favourite show on the channel and I never wanted to watch it. Who makes a kids show that creepy and dark? I don't get it. Courage was definitely its own niche and this theory claims Courage was actually Cerberus the Hellhound. Think about it, his only goal in every episode is to protect Muriel and Eustace and the house in the middle of nowhere. Their house is legit in the middle of a barren hellhole, so Courage aka Cerberus always stays in hell which is nowhere to protect mankind aka Muriel from the underworld which is characterised by all the villains he meets. Le Quack representing greed, cats representing hate and etc. And if you're wondering where that leaves Eustace, he's Hades and he rules over and hates everything in hell. And honestly I can totally see this theory being true, you guys I wouldn't even ban eyelid, I wouldn't even be surprised. At number 4 is Inspector Gadget vs Inspector Gadget. I only remember watching this show while having breakfast and getting ready for primary school in the morning. Like I don't recall it ever being on in the evening. Is that just me? Let me know. Either way, Inspector Gadget was always up against his arch nemesis, Dr. Claw, but we never got to see his face. It's like Miss Bellum and the Powerpuff Girls, like that fat, I know she's gonna be hot, just show me her. Sorry I got sidetracked, but you know, when she's slim thick, she's slim thick, you know? <laughs> Either way, this theory claims is a very specific reason we never get to see Dr. Claw, because he is the original Inspector Gadget. Gasp! The original Inspector Gadget was actually actually a cop who died on the job but he was the police force's best guy and they couldn't bear to part with him. So they built a robot that acted and looked exactly like him but there was one problem. The guy never actually died, he survived and when he saw that he was replaced with a robot he became bitter and turned into the notorious Dr. Claw. I mean it explains why they're never in the same place at the same time so you never know. Filling our number 3 slot is Samurai Utonium. I can proudly say I think I've seen nearly all the Powerpuff Girls episodes and thankfully I tried to avoid Samurai Jack as much as possible but I heard they rebooted it a few years ago, hope that's good. But can we just acknowledge the fact that Jack is literally Professor Utonium but with a man bun and a katana? Like this theory claims that Jack and Professor Utonium are the same person and that during his final showdown with Aku, Jack and him are launched into a time portal that Aku himself created. By using all his dark power, Aku gets turned into a liquid version of himself which translates to chemical. Chemical X in a new world and time period that Jack aka Professor Utonium now lives in. Jack slash Utonium dedicates his life to studying Chemical X and eventually makes good use of Aku by creating the girls. So he was evil but the girls combat that so it just really comes full circle doesn't it? Now at number 2 is Foster's Home for Imaginary Blank Part 1. I absolutely loved Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, it was so cute and funny and refreshing and all the little imaginary friends were just little gems. Either way the premise of the show is that kids have imaginary friends that everyone can see and we all just kind of coexist. When kids outgrow their imaginary friends, they give them to Foster's home created by Madam Foster. It gives the imaginary friends shelter and the option to get adopted by new kids. Now, Madam Foster runs the house with her granddaughter Frankie and her own imaginary friend Mr. Harriman. This theory argues that Madam Foster isn't real. She died due to old age and Frankie was heartbroken and just couldn't get over the loss. So she probably imagined imagined Madame Foster so no one would find out at the home because she was so dearly loved. I mean this honestly explains why Madame Foster is always so childlike and energetic despite being ancient. It also ties in with why Frankie just can't move on from her life at Foster's because the home is actually hers. Finally at number 1 is Foster's home for imaginary blank part 2. The juiciness of the theory continues but the twist here is that Frankie is actually the imaginary friend not Madame Foster. The other side of this theory argues Frankie is just a younger version of Madame Foster, they're even wearing the same thing. Madame Foster 
imagined up Frankie because if it was up to her, she would have been a lot younger when managing the home, but she's just too old for it now. Think about it, Frankie never has imaginary friends of her own, she doesn't even want one. She acts human, but she's most likely not. And it also explains why she's so happy staying at the home looking after everyone instead of going to college or something for example. Both are completely plausible, who do you think is imaginary, Madame Foster or Frankie? And that's all for today's video guys, what other cartoon theories do you want to see? I mean this was a quick pan over a bunch of them, but let me know if you want to see some specific ones, and also tell me what your favourite cartoon was or is, I'd love to know. As always I'm Eamon Hassan and I can't read the comments at the end of videos because I talk way too much anyway and they end up being 38 hours long. But I'll catch you next time, bye!